to the Old Testament, it will say that Jacob is in a camp, but it uses a word that's not used very often. And this particular camp is a place that is a thin line. It's used in scripture two places, and in this one is one of them. And the thin line is where God dwells. So this isn't just any camp. This is a camp where God dwells. It's the same word when they're talking about the Holy of Holies when Jesus dies and the curtain ripping at Jesus' death. So it's a special place. And so Jacob is wrestling all night long with this angel, this messenger of God. And they wrestle and they wrestle and they wrestle in the deepest, darkest part of night. You know that 4 a.m. when you're up and you just cannot go back to sleep. That's when they're wrestling. And they wrestle until the sun starts coming up. Jacob will not let go. Jacob is what they call tenacious. And so finally the messenger, the angel, to get away from Jacob, touches his hip and dislocates his hip. And he says, leave me alone, and Jacob's still holding on. Says, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And the angel said, what is your name? And he says, Jacob, which means supplanter. And the angel says, you are no longer Jacob. You are now Israel. And he says, Israel means one who prevails with God. You have struggled with God, and you have struggled with humans, and you have overcome it. And Jacob asked the angel, what is your name? And the angel replied, why do you ask my name? And then the angel blessed Jacob. And from that time forward, Jacob and Israel limped. He walked differently as he was no longer the pursuer of God. He had found God and was ready to serve God, not just serve himself. When he originally stole the birthright from Esau, he wanted the financial and tangible and social gains that came from that blessing. What he realized after wrestling with God was that the blessing was his all along, was the one of the heart, the one of kindness, the one of compassion, the one of love, the gifts that he always had. And this is how he was to serve God. So how are we to serve God? We don't all have the same gifts. As I I look out here and I I see your faces, I, I see the people here full of incredible gifts and they're not all the same and that's what makes it so wonderful is that each can use the gift that they have and do with it what they can and sometimes we don't even have the same gifts that we had 20 years ago but we have new gifts and different gifts now when I was in my 20s I was the Mother's Day out director and I was in the church office one day and the church treasurer was there and There were some checks on the table as it was Monday after Sunday service, and I saw this check, and on it, it was from one of our preschool families, and I shouldn't have looked, I admit, but I couldn't help, and the check was made out for $100, and I remember being in awe because there was not any way possible that my family could write a check to the church for $100. I was in my 20s, we had four kids, and $100 was an entire week's worth of groceries. And giving it to the church, even though it would be great, just wasn't something that could happen. But what we did have was the ability to give back to the church in our time and our talents. And I wasn't sure how much I knew about God at that point in time. I knew God loved me, but as far as scripture, but I knew that I could teach preschool because surely I could read faster than preschoolers have and I could prepare a lesson that a four-year-old could learn from. So I started teaching Sunday school. And one of the gifts that Danny had was to play basketball. And so he started a clinic for the young kids that were there that wanted to learn basketball. 
so we could give back in time and in talent. Well, we moved from here in Houston to North Carolina, and at that point, I felt like we were constantly taken from the church. At that point in time, I went back to school, and the church paid for my tuition. They paid for my books, and someone in the congregation gave me airline miles to fly back and forth to class when I needed to go. And not only that, they sent my kids to summer camp because we couldn't have afforded it. But I've got to tell you, when I was consecrated to deaconess, the very first thing I did with my very first paycheck was write a check to the church for $100. Now, it was the gift for the whole month, but I felt so proud. And I promise you, when I put that check in the plate, that plate just lit up gold. It was like, oh, the angels sang. Because for so long, I had wanted to be able to give the church $100. Now, eventually, that $100 a month was able to grow to $200, and then it grew to $300. And then when I got ordained, I cannot tell you how exciting it was the very first year that we were able to put in $100 a week. It was like, ah, we did it. And then the next year, we upped that a little bit. And this year, we're going to try to up a little bit more. And I'm sharing this with you because I know circumstances change. And sometimes time and talent are what you have and what you have a lot of. And other times, it's money. And your body's just not doing what it used to do. I get that, too. But it takes all of us to work together everything we have to make this a community. Now, I know that pledging to pay a water bill and an electric bill is not exciting. So I don't want you to think when you pledge that you're pledging to pay the water bill and the electric bill. What I want you to think of is that when you pledge and pay to the general fund, that you're paying for a bunch of youth to be able to spend the night in this building, to watch movies all night long, and to have the lights when they need them, and to turn them off when they need them, and to have toilets to use when they need them to. And I know it's not very much fun to say, I'm going to give money to the general fund so they can have people out there mowing the yard. But what I want you to think of is when I give money to the general fund, I get to on Easter as these children have just learned about the risen Christ to watch kids out in this beautiful landscape we have looking for Easter eggs and the excitement and the thrill that they have. And at other times to be in the church office and to look out and to see people in the neighborhood walking up to the little lending library. And they can do that because the grass is mowed and it looks beautiful and the water is on so the grass can be green. That's the ministry to this congregation that giving to the general fund gives us. You see, we're beginning to have good problems at this church. What is a good problem, you ask? Well, having to begin to reserve space in the building with the church office before you use it, because it used to be that you could set up for an event, nothing would happen for days, and it would be set up. Now that's not the case. You see, now there's something happening in that fellowship hall almost every day, and often many, many nights, and the same with the conference room, which I think is very exciting. There's more stuff going on in that conference room than you would ever believe. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a good problem to have, that we have to reserve space because there's so much going on. This is ministry. Today, you will receive ministry, stewardship ministry materials. I ask you to be like Jacob and pray about them before you do anything else. And wrestle with them with God. And ask God again and again and again, like the, day in, the lady in the gospel. Ask the judge, what should I do? Where is your heart leading you? 
where is your talent leading you? Maybe there's some kind of ministry that you've always wanted to see at this church, but it just wasn't there, and you're really feeling like you need to do it. That's the Holy Spirit leading. And the best ministry comes when someone in the congregation has a passion, something that just keeps knocking them in the head saying, do this, do this, do this. And your financial pledge, how exciting it would be for the council when they sit down with the budget to not have to wrestle and cut ministry out. You would hear it all the way to your home with people going, woohoo, we don't have to take 20% off of what we're doing for youth or 20% off of the choir or 20% off of anything else. We have the money that we need to do whatever it is we need to do. Can you imagine if we had the budget to fund a part-time youth director instead of one just seven hours a week? You see, Leanne already does youth Sunday school and youth movie night and a high school youth group all in just seven hours a week. Can you imagine if we had her for 20, what could be done? And let me tell you about this high school group that she's got going on. She has gone to all of the other churches in our conference, Lutheran and Presbyterian, and contacted them. And the senior high from churches all the way from Alvin up through Pasadena are joining together once a month to go on high school things. This is something coming out of our church and our youth for seven hours. Can you imagine if we had the money to pay her for 20, what she would do? And Scott, how amazing are his gifts? You saw today's video. He showed it to me this morning, and I started crying. I mean, it is amazing what we did one day in 20 minutes, 275 boxes of food. That's 275 families that have a week's worth of food. You did it. Can you imagine the expanded social media and video presence we could have if we could further fund Scott's mission and ministry here? And the music program. Oh, additional funding. We could have trumpets. We could have lead singers. Maybe we could have a bell choir. It, the, the possibilities are limitless if we could fund it. And my dream, oh, my dream is that we could have a seminary intern. You see, we have the congregation of the future already. We have a joint Presbyterian Lutheran church. And this is where the seminaries would love to put interns in because if they did that, we could form help form the pastors of the future. And this church, both Lutheran and Presbyterian, need pastors so badly. And we could be that church that has the seminarians come through that form the future of serving Christ. How exciting would that be? Our Old Testament lesson is the story of a family, our family, as we too are descendants from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus. We have been blessed like Jacob, and like Jacob, our names were changed by God. Jacob's was changed when he saw God's face to face, and ours was changed in our baptism when we took on the name Christian. Like Jacob, we are called to ministry using our God-given gifts. So on November 20th, when you walk down this aisle and you place your stewardship forms in the basket, I hope you too have a new walk, and not because your hip's out of joint, <laughs> but that new walk, that stride that says you have had a personal encounter with God and the two of you have decided the best way that you can serve the mission and ministry at Memorial Lutheran and First Presbyterian churches here in Texas City. Together, we can serve this community that we call home. We have all been blessed. You have been blessed. How will you 
bless others in the upcoming year. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.